So we talked about nurture versus nature, and back in the day, yeah, it was all about that, wasn't it? And I know it was unfair, because I know most of you who wants that, you wanted to be, the, even the people over here wanted to be in the middle somewhere, didn't we? But I didn't let you do that, because I wanted to create this divergence of opinion for the, for the sake of the game and the sake of the interest of conversation. But this is kind of where we were, or, you know, is this idea of it's one or the other? Which one is it? Which one am I going to put all my money on? Where am I going to, you know, put my investment? Am I going to start measuring limb lengths? And am I going to start looking at... Um, physiological markers and they're going to be my determinants and then that's what's going to get me uh, an Olympian or are we saying let's create environments and the two things were you know pretty opposed for a long time um, and then people moved in the direction as sort of social science and, um, and hard science if you like physical science started to you know they started to talk every now and again they'd have a conversation and they started to go down this idea of its genetics sort of plus the environment. So you start with a set of genes, that's what you've got. And then obviously the environment then takes you from there and builds on that. So I, um, I'm interested in this stuff. So I started reading this guy's book, Professor Patrick Bateson. He wrote a book called Design for a Life, about epigenetics and, and, and the idea of, um, you know, the, the your genes aren't your fate maybe. Uh, it's pretty heavy going, so what I decided to do is I, I rang him and invited him out for lunch and he graciously, graciously accepted. And so for three hours I wrote and let my steak go cold while he munched away and told me all these fascinating things. And um, he, he says that, you know, he, he prefers sort of David Schenk's kind of concept, a genius of all of, in all of us. He says he's not exactly right, but he kind of likes this idea because he's saying, you know, what we're learning now from epigenetics is this idea of genetics and this dynamic interplay between the two. And actually, you know, in, it, within life, but also through generations, this idea that actually, you know, your genetics are not necessarily fixed and that they can change. And also what we're now beginning to see is that, you know, there are, there are actually examples now, and this comes back to the whole resilience idea, where uh, genes, you know, are actually changing within, within, your, li within your lifespan. So it, it's the, the McGill rat study. So what the McGill rat study d uh, discovered was that um, you basically have two types of rat, um, or they created two types of rat. You've got your anxious or skittish rat um, that, you know, you take them outside their cage and you put them in a bit of an environment and they're like a little bit, oh, don't know what to do, and they go a little bit, little, little bit bonkers. And then what you've got, they call them the um, relaxed rat. I call them the double hard bastard rats. Right, and they're like you know they're tough and they're solid and they know what they're about and they uh, they can they can cope with pretty much anything. Um, and actually, you know, you put them outside their environment, they're like, yeah, 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 I'm fine, I'm all right, I know what I'm doing. Now, what they discovered with this was, and there's actually a great a great website that where I got all these sort of images from. Um, what they found was that um, anxious rats are born to anxious, skittish rats are born to skittish mothers. Makes sense, yeah, genetically makes sense. And double hard bastard rats are born to double hard bastard mothers. And um, but what they found was if you take a skittish rat at birth and you put it with a double hard bastard mother, it becomes a double hard bastard rat. Now that's interesting, isn't it? So and what, what did they discover? Well, how was this? They lick them. It's all about the licking. So um, the message here is if we want to nurture talent. <laughs> yeah? Um, so what they said is, so what they found was is actually, and what they found was is actually gene receptors and there's gene expression that is actually happening to make this happen. So the anxiety levels are, you know, take a, 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 a rat born to a skittish mother with skittishness, doesn't get any licking, put it with a, put it with, at birth with a, a nurturing mother and boom, it's, it's double hard bastard rat. And but what they then did was they then flipped it. So they actually injected the, the, the rats that were born skittish, became double hard bastards, injected it, put a, put a kind of a blocker in there, and it went back to being skittish. And they looked at that as well. And, they said, yeah. and then what they then did was they found, actually, that um, they didn't have to put the injection in. They could actually manipulate it through environmental constraints. Here's the interesting thing, though. On the other way around, what they did was they got the, um, the rats that were born double hard bastards, put them with skittish mothers, they became skittish, and then when they reversed it, they became super double hard bastard rats. <laughs> so what did Professor Bateson, why was he telling me this story? Now, apparently the research has moved on, and we have begun to see some, some interesting studies around human behavior and all that sort of stuff. Um, and what they're, they're postulating, or the theory here is, is that um, you know, the concept of resilience is, is a developable thing. 
And so, you know, you've seen research out there, the talent needs trauma and da 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 and all these sorts of things. Well, what we're sort of saying here is, is that somehow um, we can take people who maybe show anxiety or maybe show uh, whatever, and we can actually, through environmental constraints or whatever it is, we can potentially manipulate those kinds of things. So resilience, grit, these kinds of things, it's a developable concept. That's interesting for me, it's interesting for pathway people, because what it says is if this is a kind of key driver, a key determinant of success, um, we may have to look at this. And somebody earlier on said something about um, the, what do you do, oh, I think it was Danny when he was talking about, what do you do if you've got somebody who uh, is a, an outlier? Well, it may be that those outliers are those anxious, skittish rats, don't quite know how to cope with the world around them, and what's stopping them from progressing is the environment, whatever that environment might, might be. It might be parental, it might be our environment. You know, we don't know how much we can influence that with our environments, but that might be one of the, one of the key determinants. Now, I'm only sort of postulating this. But what I'm saying is this research was a game changer for me because it made me think, I don't know, there's not enough we know about genes yet. We know there's a lot of things that are potentially changeable. There's a lot of things that maybe aren't. We don't know, it's continued. While we don't know that, one of the things that we can control is environments. So if we can get our environments right, then potentially we can start to take people who show anxiety and we can help them become more robust. We can take people who are too robust and give them the right sense of anxiety. Because actually anxiety can be, input, can be useful. And I'm, I'm treading into dangerous terms here because we've got clinical psychologists in the room. But what they're saying, you know, what they say is like an anxious rat, for example, is actually quite useful to be anxious because it, it saves your life if a big cat comes along. Whereas a double R bastard rat says, come on, and then he dies. So, you know, you've got to be careful. You, know, you can be too robust, you can be too anxious. So it's about finding the right balance. Anyway, we'll move on from rats. Um, so this story interested me greatly. Um, anybody listen to Radiolab? I highly recommend it. Um, there's usually something of a nugget there. I mean, I spend a lot of time in car, like most of you do, and it's a, it's a source of real insight. They did a story on this. Um, so... Kit Kano, 1968 uh, Olympics. He ran at altitude, seven and a half thousand feet, I think. Um, and he decided to run in the 1500, a 5000, and a 10,000. In the, um, I think he ran the 5000 first, and he got a gallbladder infection. And he collapsed. And the doctor, German doctor, said, Look, you know, you're done. Sorry, your games are over. You really can't run with this. So uh, apparently, uh, Kano decided that's not listening to that. Ran the ten thousand, got silver, and then and after that, he's completely wasted. And the doctor says, "Right now, you're going to die if you run again." Apparently, it might be an apocryphal story, but apparently, what he then did was uh, on the morning of the fifteen hundred, he's up against the the great white hope of the Americans, Jim Ryan, and on the morning he says, "If I'm going to die, I'm going to die on the track," and he gets up and he runs the fifteen hundred. Gun goes, boom, takes the lead. And he runs and he runs. Now, Ryan, he's famous for his kick. And everyone's thinking Ryan's going to catch him. There's no way he's running and he's grimacing and you can see he's in pain and he's really struggling and he's challenged. And he keeps going, and he keeps going, he keeps going, he keeps going. And Ryan puts his kick on, doesn't catch him, wins the gold medal with a gallbladder infection. Now, uh, David Epstein, sports gene, I imagine everyone's read that. Um, he, 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 he kind of puts the whole Kalenjin thing, yeah? So Kano's from the Kalenjin tribe, as most Kenyan runners are. Um, and, you know, he puts it down to, you know, there's, they're an anilotic people, you know? So he, he's, he's prepared to accept some of the environmental influences, but they're anilotic people, yeah? They've got thin ankles, thin legs. Um, as a result, you've got thin legs. That means you've got less weight, which means that you, you generate less energy. And as a result, he would be over here in saying that was the biggest difference in Kit Kano and the Kenyan runners' success is they're an allotic people and there's a big genetic component. Yes, that is true. We accept, of course, as well that they run to school, but lots of people run to school and they don't become Olympic champions. We also accept that, um, you know, that the, there's a culture of running in this scenario and there's also the, now they've got role models, so everybody goes towards this. Um, but there was an interesting area that we won't know about this story that I find very, very interesting. And that is that the Kalenjin have a particular... Um, if you're, of a, if you're of a squeamish disposition, then you know, be careful here, because I'm going to... So the Kalenjin have a particular ritual. At 13, all Kalenjin boys go through a circumcision ritual. 
And what they do is they get, um, they get, initially they get beaten with sticks. And then what they do is they put mud on their faces and they put them through this circumcision process. And if the mud cracks once it's gone dry, then they all beat them. And they have to run from wherever to wherever to wherever and they go through this very elaborate uh, circumcision ritual. Hap same thing happens to, to uh, Kalenjin women as well. Um, and in speaking to a number of people from the Kalenjin, from the Kalenjin uh, 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 tribe, what they say is, is that that gives them a completely different idea about pain. And it gives them a completely different idea about um, going through hardship and going through challenges. So after going through this experience, Kit Kano, you can imagine, can't you, saying, it's just a gallbladder infection. I did through this whole circumcision thing when I was 13. It's nothing I can run through that. Now, for me, that's an interesting thing in terms of, I mean, I know it's a slightly extreme thing, and we talk about trauma, and that might be going a little bit far. I'm not saying we're going to start ritual circumcisions for all our kids. <laughs> Before you go there, I'm not completely bonkers. But I think there's some interesting things there that are about environmental, uh, environmental things that particularly happen that are kind of unique to that particular tribe, which may go some way to explaining some of their, some of their success. I'm not, not saying the whole thing. So, um, so that takes us down that whole grit, resilience, pain threshold thing. You know, I talk about these sorts of environmental factors, you know, around this thing I call the talent ID spurg. See what I did? Um, you know, and if we talk about grit, you know, obsession, concentration, dedication, self-belief, reaction to failure, all of these different things, you know, uh, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, is it? Right? My frustration with pathways is we don't really look at this. So my sport, and I was talking to James about this. James does quite a bit of work with our sport, so, you know, he, he, and, uh, and it's, it's good and, all, you know, and really valuable. But we've got 14 academies, and our provision, psychology provision, is very minimal. We've only, in the last couple of years, um, hired, a, a, we've actually got a full-time uh, psychologist within the sport. Now, there are various people working on different things, but actually within the actual sport, we've, only got, we've got a single... Uh, psychologist trying to work across the whole pathway and and one of the things we talk about is if behaviors are very important if these behaviors are going to be key drivers if they're developable as we believe environments can make them developable surely we need to be resourcing this more within the pathway surely we need to be developing players with these kinds of capabilities and let's see where they can go we generally speaking, when it comes to identification, look at what they can do. Performance-wise, we generally speaking look at them, look at the things that are easy to measure. You know, their physicality, we look at uh, their speed, we look at strength, we look at power, we'll look at their technical capabilities, we'll look at some of their decision-making capabilities. What we won't necessarily look at in as much depth is what drives that. And what drives that is, is here, and these are, these are things that we can develop. So, then I look at our coach education, and I'm not just blaming rugby here because this is the whole landscape, every sport's the same. Coaches working with the adolescent player or the adolescent athlete or the adolescent um, sports participant who are part of a pathway system or they might be on the outskirts of the pathway system or whatever it might be, how much development do they get in looking at how they might be able to develop these attributes in a young adolescent athlete? And what I've found in my time working across the landscape is very, very little. Now, it's getting better, and I know it's improving, and we've got days like today and everything else it is, but if you start to come down the system, it's very little. And there is information out there that we could utilise to help shape this information. What we're finding, though, is, is that it's the, um, you know, it's the popular press with, you know, or it's, the, it's authors who are putting, putting together their spin on particular aspects of research, and that's how this message is starting to drip into the landscape. It's not necessarily being driven by sport or sports governing bodies who are actually putting this into their coach ed. And if I was to show you our coach ed stuff right now, what you would see is there would be about 100 courses, and of those 100 courses, 98% of those courses would be about the on-pitch, technical, tactical, that kind of stuff you would see very, very little that was about anything else at all. So I feel, for me, I feel that's a really big challenge and it's something that we need to address. We were very fortunate to have this absolutely fantastic woman come and speak at a conference two years ago. Um, 
she happened to be coming over. She comes over every year. It's a secret that nobody knows, but it's worth, worth it if you know. Around about December, she comes over because her husband's involved in the theatre and they come over to watch some West End shows. So if you can find out when, you can get her to come to your conference if you're prepared to put your conference on at that time. Anyway, she's not cheap either, but we got her over and, and uh, she's this small. I mean, she arrives, she's like a little old lady, and I'm thinking, oh my God, she's going to be in front of these giant rugby guys. How is she going to get on? She gets on stage like a rock star. She's got the whole place eating out of her hand, right? And, you know, she comes out with these nuggets. Like, you know, nobody comes home from work today and says, you know, I had the most amazing struggle today. She talks about the tyranny of now versus the power of yet. Um, you know, and you've got these, like, nuggets that you can go away from. Now, we all know about the growth mindset stuff, right? But the biggest one I want to share with you is the one that she's come out with recently, where she said, people are using a growth mindset like, we, like the thing that she was trying to fight against, which is the self-esteem movement. So they're using it now as another mechanism for self-esteem, for driving self-esteem. She said, growth mindset's not a proclamation. It's not something you have. It's a journey. It's something you continuously work on. It's a practice. And the point is, we're sort of saying, oh, you've got a fixed mindset. Maybe at that particular time, but actually it's something that we can then develop and something we can work on. What we do know, though, about that piece of research with the whole growth mindset, fixed mindset thing is it's actually quite an interesting thing because it's driven by environment again. Just use of language, you know, so t instead of talking about um, output and outcome, talking a little bit about process. You know, not saying to my daughter when she brings me a painting that she's very, very proud of, not saying, wow, that's amazing, and saying, tell me more about that, right? And it's very hard. It's very difficult even as a parent. You know, I've got this whole thing going on. Um, and then conveying this message down there where we've actually got this whole idea of the self-esteem movement that's saying we've got to tell kids they're great, we've got to give them positive energy, we've got to have positivity, well, in actual fact, maybe we don't need to be talking about that. We need to be engaging them in the process of learning and talking about that kind of process. Actually, validation, you know, validation of your attention is enough. It doesn't have to be this big outlandish, say, a, a piece of feedback. Um, so this is an interesting uh, area for me as well. Um, I've mentioned ecological dynamics. Keith Davids is you know, a big influence on, on, of mine, on mine. And I just, I really like this quote. I've been saying it all the time to anybody who will listen. Unfortunately, you're here too, so you get it as well. Uh, and I just think it kind of sort of brings home what we're talking about. How do we develop creative, adaptable, um, resilient, self-organizing decision makers if we don't create an environment that fosters that? What does that environment need to look like? What do the people in that environment need to be able to do. And that's a key, key driver for me. Um, and that's a big piece of work. This gentleman, he's a personal friend of mine. I'll be totally honest with you. It's not a plug for his, his services. Um, he's perfectly busy enough right now working in football. Jamie Edwards uh, wor has worked in pathways that I've been involved in helping educate coaches for a long time. I bought my development team of six guys, six player development officers. I bought them a Christmas present of spending three days at a retreat with Jamie at his train brain uh, environment. And what Jamie does, which I like, um, is he talks about tools. And one of the things he talks about a lot is how we can help people as coaches to have the appropriate tools. This is one of his clients. He's got a number of others. He's working with um, with Christian Bale, he's working with um, Luke Shaw, a number of other bit different people, but Joe is one of them, and Joe's quite a big advocate and doesn't mind anybody knowing he's working with him. But Joe says this thing of the football is the easy bit. He said it's everything else he has to contend with, and as we all know, Joe's had some big challenges. Um, but one of the things he says is, if only I had this when I was coming through. If only I had the tools to help me navigate, it would have really helped me, instead of getting to a crisis point, and then we've got to sort something out. So the, the system creates the challenge, whether it's by design or by, or by accident, and then we have to give tools to the people, it, or we have to then work on them and give them, and give them a lot of time. I mean, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, James will attest to this, is that that tends to be a lot of the work. It's fixing stuff, it's retrofit work. Whereas in reality, I think, I think anybody working in this space 
with the, the skills to do so, would prefer to be equipping people, getting them tooled up, if you like, to go through the landscape, because then who knows what their potential could be? They don't have to reach the limitation before and ever. So it's very interesting to hear the discussion around where do we do this in the pathway. I don't know the answer to that, but I think it needs to be probably earlier than where we currently do. And I know there's a resource issue, but my opinion is, is that we either need to educate coaches to be able to do some of this, or we've got to put the resource in there to help these athletes through the journey. Um, you know, we talk about failure. I want to talk about failure just a little bit. I just want to share with you this video. Just sorry, take that quote back a second. Um, I don't know if you've, has anyone read Stan McChrystal's book, Team of Teams? It's, it's worth it. He talks about complexity theory quite a bit, but it's fairly accessible. But he talks a lot about, and I would have referred to it had we had our special forces person here about, and they talk about like elite special forces training and the approach that goes through. Stan talks about the fact that, you know, the, the BUDS training that SEALs go through. It's you know, famously, ridiculously difficult, and a lot of people drop out and all that. He says that's not about wheedling out the weak. It's about fostering a togetherness that will last a lifetime. It's about building connectivity. Because a lot of the people who go through BUDS, and they're in their teams of six with the boats and everything else, they're lifelong friends thereafter. And it's also about forcing individuals to let go of ego in order to collectively work collaboratively together. Because the people who are the strongest are the ones who usually struggle because they think they can do it all and they don't take into account the relative, of relative strengths and weaknesses of everybody else on their team. So it drives a lot of other aspects, not just get rid of people. But it's de deliberately hard in order to create that. That's that environment. We're in different sp a different space. But I think there's something to learn from there. I kind of like this video, if you'll permit me. I've never seen somebody so afraid to fail. I've never seen a society so afraid to fail. Pride and ego have taken the forefront of athletes' work ethic, pushing back the vulnerable mentality it takes to improve one's game. We obsess over perfection while forgetting the process of imperfection it takes to get there. Show me a player who's shooting 100% of practice, and I'll show you a player who's not taking game like shots. Show me a player who doesn't lose the ball, and I'll show you a player who isn't going hard enough. Show me a player who doesn't make mistakes, and I'll show you a player who's not getting better. <laughs> it's funny because the other day, a player came up to me and said, Hey Trey, how many free throws did you miss? I said, 14. What about you? He said with a smirk on his face, zero. I said, well, how many did you shoot? He said, 15. I said, I shot 100, failed harder. I challenge every hooper who steps foot on that court, fail harder. Don't worry about what your coach may think, don't worry about your friends judging you, nobody. Any coach who bashes you for taking a risk and making a mistake, he's no longer a coach, he's a critic. Any friend who judges you for your mistakes in practice aren't your friends anyway. While they're busy critiquing, let's get better. Let's see who really has the last laugh. Tell them to enjoy the time now, because our time is coming. All we did was take the long way. So, um, see, you're all looking at that now, aren't you? You're wondering where I'm going to go. Um, I think this whole idea of failure is an interesting one. And I'll talk about this from my own perspectives as a talent coach, but also just as a general rule. Um, I have a strange job at the RFU. So I'm part pathway and part retention. So I've actually run, I actually run programs and campaigns to bring players back, 25-year-olds uh, and what have you, and try and stop them leaving in the first place. And you would think, wouldn't you, that that's, that's pulling in different directions. But I think they can potentially work quite harmoniously. Um, but the big area, the, the challenge for me with that, you see, is that when I'm working across this different landscape, I'm thinking about how do I develop players and challenge them enough, but also how can I keep them playing rugby forever? 
And that's pretty difficult, isn't it? Because you sort of find yourself in a different situation. You're sort of thinking, well, I want to do that because I know it might create a lot of challenge for, for players and it might develop them and we might create some traumatic experiences that will you know, unlock the lid on their abilities. But I don't want to go too far because if I do, they might all leave the game. So there's some big challenges there. And the, one, the, the C word for me that is consequences. Or if you want to use a more technical phrase, the periodization of challenge. There is some research out there coming, emerging from one of our academies, interestingly enough, that relative age effect is a necessary component of talent development. And the reason for that is the, the conclusion, which is, I think is still a bit of a conceptual leap, however, the conclusion drawn from that is that it's the, if you watch the way relative age happens, is the intake is all you know, Q, uh, Q1, Q2. By the end, it's Q3, Q4. And they're postulating that actually the reason it is is that the kids who don't get selected earlier on get gritty. So they are challenged by the deselection, they work harder, they come back, and the kids in the system are picked either because they are maturationally superior or they have a relative age advantage. Um, they actually are less gritty and they sort of um, just, just sort of don't progress as far and therefore we, you know, these kids overtake them by the end. That's the theory. I think there's way more to it than that. However, this idea of periodization of challenge is quite interesting. Because what that's basically saying is, how can we challenge these different individuals as they're working through the system? So if you're big and you've got an advantage early, um, but we know maybe that you may then rest on your laurels, what can we do to challenge you whilst the other kids are out there being really gritty? Plus, if it is true that you need relative age and deselection in order to create gritty players, what level of attrition are we happy to accept in order to produce five amazing players? Ross, uh, Dr. Ross Tucker said something very interesting at our conference recently, and he said, you, we're trying to create an efficient, uh, a really efficient pathway. You know, we're trying to create one that's seamless, smooth, make everybody work through. But you might not want that. You might want a fairly inefficient pathway with some deliberate, deliberate speed bumps built into it. You might actually accept some of your deselection challenges, and it might create attrition, on the basis that instead of creating you know, a team of really good players, you create five world-class players. So you might not want your system to be too efficient. You might, you might want some inefficiency actually deliberately built in there, or you just accept the inefficiency of your system of systems and say, you know what, some of the, in, some of the, some of the difficulties there are actually valuable. I would prefer to make it slightly more designed, designed and slightly more specific, if we possibly could, um, but I would, I would go down that road. So, for example, um, I, and I want to, I'll talk to you about an example of that in a minute. Um, the other aspect of consequence and failure that I think is really important as well, though, is how, how I've, I've often found in my experiences that people re recoil at the word consequence. And I quite liked what Harvey was talking about around, and we were talking about it in the break, about the idea of let's put a, let's put a hundred quid on it because actually that creates the sort of pressure, the stress that we need to do. Now, some people in a participation landscape, I can hear people, you know, if I was to suggest that within one of our pathway scenarios, they'd be like, whoa, you can't do that. That's ethically, you know, and you know, that's, that's completely wrong. So that's a major issue that we need to overcome because actually if we think that some of these challenges are gonna be important, you know, we can avoid what I call the pollution of performance by participation. Now, I know I'm, I, I appreciate I'm talking to a captive audience here. I feel this very acutely because I basically straddle the participation and development landscape and the pathway. And most people who work in pathways are doing a bit of both. The problem you're getting is, is that I feel like there's this regressive approach where we're saying, you can't do that, you can't do that because people might drop out. You can't do that because people might leave. You can't do that because this. And what we're ending up doing is we're kind of, we're, we're kind of boiling it down and we're, we're making it like less effective as a result. And yet we know that failure and consequence is actually a really important part of development. We know that challenge is a very important part of development because it will help to develop those qualities we've talked about at the outset. And therefore, if that is the case, then actually we need to be able to push back against that. And I think the, the fact that you know, you've got some really clear data that shows the impact is valuable. I also think there's an argument to say, if you develop those qualities in a young player, you have a way better chance of retaining them in your sport because they'll fall in love with it. Because if they develop through challenge this feeling of accomplishment, this feeling of, 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 of achieving something, a feeling of, of having got better, of having made something of themselves, that connects them to the sport in a way that you probably wouldn't otherwise. However, 
that requires very, very skillful handling. It brings us back to the environment, brings us back to the coach. So again, you know, that's where you've got to put your resources if you want to go down this road. It's not a simple, simple thing to do. I mean, I talk about the talent equation. This is my whole thing. You know, I think ability, whatever it might be, the hardware, the physical, the technical, the tactical, you know, we do that. That's all good, whatever you've got there. But multiply that by whatever grit you've got, your software. And I, I, grit is a, you know, almost like a euphemism for lots of other things. My frustration, of course, is if you look at the resources, if I was to make this, and probably I ought to, if I was to make these balls based on the size of resources we put into, if we look at the resourcing we put into the hardware, S and C, and any S and C's in the room, I know by all means I understand there's a rationale to do that. What I'm saying is, is that S and C, analytics, all that kind of stuff is huge business. And compare that to the level of resource that goes into developing the software in the players, and it's, it's minuscule in comparison. And we need to redress that because if this is going to be our next stage and our missing link, then we need to look at a way of putting that resource in place. And of course, environments are key and we need time. So just, just quickly, I'm just going to just take you through to a little example that I want to just talk to you about. As a, so in my academy, I've got these two players. Names have been changed for the purposes of anonymity, um, in case any of you are related to any of these kids. Um, Tommy's one of those kids who's just had it, had it easy. Very, very supportive. Um, he's 17, got into the England under 16 side, um, and you know, went to a school, very, very supportive school, very supportive family, everything else. Came to my Nags Academy, and he didn't get selected for 18s, and this year, he has not been right. He has been, he has been, a, pro been a problem, he's, you can clearly see he's disconnected. He can so I sent him an email, and I said to him, you know, kind of, I just very subtly, quietly said to him, like, what's, what's going on, da 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 you know, there's some issues here, da 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 And his, it's his mum's email address, because obviously I've got the kids, so I sent it to his mum, and his mum rings me up and says, we've got some issues. And this whole hour-long conversation of all these challenges, he's changed his environment, he's gone to a different college, he didn't get to 18s, he's thinking of dropping out. And that's a good example of how too easy, too young, first piece of challenge, boom. He's dropping out. Why? Partly because uh, he's got contingent self-worth. Again, a concept that I'm not going to go into. But you know, this idea that his ability at his hockey is wrapped up with his idea of who he is. So therefore, comes into the environment and he's, you know, he's, he's now seen, he's got shame because he didn't make it and some of his friends who were there have. And he's now not reacting in the same way and all that sort of stuff. Now, that's not my job as a talent coach. I'm there on a Monday night for two hours to create an environment to help them learn technical, tactical, da 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 That's not my job, but it is. Because that's, that's actually the thing. This kid's going to drop out and he's got ability. And actually, I've now got to find a way of actually trying to get through to him and he's going to call me when he calls me. Um, and I've now got to go back to him and say, he hasn't called me yet, but I don't want to push too hard because he's got to come to me. But the thing is, is I've got to create that opportunity for him because otherwise, you know, how will I be able to live with myself with, and this is one, and I've got, I've got 15, and I can't do it for all of them necessarily, but this is one in particular as a case study that I'm trying to work with. Um, and the, the biggest thing for me with, with that particular scenario is, could we potentially have equipped him with tools that would have helped him meet this challenge? Could this deselection have actually been used as a deliberate thing. It wasn't, it's just, to, and I, I said to Danny and uh, Ed that I was going to talk about this, so they're quite happy for me to talk about this. Um, but, you know, is that deliberate? No, it isn't. He's just been deselected, but he hasn't been equipped. So that's an area for me that I think really, we, you know, it, it's, it's an example of what I mean. He's not gritty enough. He's very dedicated, and by Angela Duckworth, he's very, you know, he, he, they're never on holiday, this family because every summer he's doing some sort of national age group stuff. He, you know, I mean, there is a burnout component here potentially as well. But what I'm saying is, is that he's very dedicated to his sport, and now he, reaches, he has this setback and he has got no tools to equip him to react to that. Anna, on the other hand, is different. And this is like a difference between boys and girls. So in our academy, we have boys and girls, 16s and 18s. It's quite challenging, right, because you've got different age groups, boys and girls mixed together. Some of the boys don't like training with the girls, even though the girls really benefit from training with the boys, blah, 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 blah. But the thing about Anna, and actually it's not just Anna, there's lots of Annas in my academy. And the biggest thing with them is, is that they come in so afraid to fail, it's unbelievable. 
there's a conditioning element from whatever environment they're in, which is a, probably about an error correction scenario, where they come in and you say to them, right, let's explore this concept, let's try and solve this problem, and they just do what they know they can. And so I have one-to-one -one conversations with these individuals. I pull them over and go, see what you did there? And they go, yeah, yeah, what do you think of it? And they'll go, oh, well, I could have done this and I could have done that because they're so used to the idea that they're going to be given some correction. And I'll say to them, I like it. I want you to do more. And I said, if I see you doing something that's safe and I know that you can do, then we're going to have a bit of an interesting conversation. But if I see you doing something that's stretching yourself and taking yourself beyond your capabilities, then we're going to go somewhere. I'm not saying I've got it right everywhere, and I'm not saying like I'm Wonder Talent Coach or anything like that, but what I am saying is, is that my environment, for me, it's very important that we actually take these kids out of the failure scenario. Interestingly, on the boys, it's different. They're still afraid to fail. They come from environments that do not allow them to fail because it's about winning competitions at the weekend and things like that. My academy, and this is the brilliant thing about the Enags Academy that they created, and I'm hoping they keep it going, is they're free of competition. They can come and explore. And as a coach, it's a fabulous environment to be in. And, and what we do with them is we allow them to go through that exploratory process. The boys, they go a different way. They're afraid to fail, and they're afraid they don't want to be shamed in front of their people, so in front of their, other, uh, their, their peers. So what they do is they overdo it. So they'll go for crazy things that they know that they're never going to work out, because it's safer to fail at something like that than try and do the basics well, you know, really effectively, and get that wrong. And that's quite an interesting thing that you've got to try and unpick, and it's very difficult, and doing all of that with one-to-ones as well, and that's been really, really difficult. But these are the sorts of challenges that I face as a coach. So now, going back to my point around what development have I had to help with that process? None. I invested myself by going on Jamie Edwards's train brain camp and doing other things and reading around the subject and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because I passionately believe this is the thing that's going to unlock these kids' potential. I don't have enough time to do it. I don't have enough resource to do it. I don't have everything else. But I still think it's really, really important. I kind of want to leave, leave you that with like a personal story, a personal case study, because I just think it kind of hopefully illustrates something of what I'm trying to do in terms of if we can do anything at all, can we, challenge, can we put some, some time and space and effort into people who are working at the coalface like this? And I think it would be interesting to see what emerges from that. Um, so final thing. Oh, a one, one very quick story. Wet weather, England golf, got to tell you this story. We came 14th in the, under, in the European Under 18th Championships when I was working in golf, right? So this is England, right, with, we've got 90,000 junior golfers and 2,000 golf clubs, okay? The team that came first was Norway. It's dark half the year. They've got 5,000 players and about 200 golf clubs, okay? And they, they came first and we came 14th. And we did a bit of review and you know, we made a number of recommendations and this, that, and the other, and the chief executive at the time said, we have been the envy of golf, European golf, for the last however many years. If it's not broke, don't fix it. We just came 14th. With a, you know, a nation of our, you know, third would have been bad. And what came out of it was, one of the things that came out of it was, the players said they really struggled to play in the wet weather clothes that they were provided with. And so somebody said to them, did you play with them in them before you actually went into competition no why not we never needed to if it was raining we went to the range <laughs> it's a true story straight up true story now why is that well because these kids actually yeah we've got facilities it's amazing we've got to keep it nice and dry and calm and we can do proper work and technical work and this that and the other instead of saying it's raining there's an opportunity it's a constraint you know wham let's get out there Let's see what happens. Play in that. See how you get on. See how you can react to the environment. See how adaptable you are. See how creative you can be under that kind of pressure. So significant cultural shift. So I just want to talk to you very quickly about my N equals 1 experiment. This is my little boy, Evan. He's, six. He's eight now, but he was six when he took this video. Right, now he, he has a few golf lessons and stuff like that. He doesn't get coached by me, I promise. We just play. We were playing this day, and the, be, beware the power of the Twix, 
Okay, this is the story. So the story, we're playing this day and we're playing a par three course, it's three hole par three course, and I said to him, we played a few rounds, and he was getting a bit good, and he's beating me. He has his own, he has every par, which is he gets to do it in six and I have to do it in three. It's quite difficult for me, so it's good practice for me. So I said, why don't we play for that? Because afterwards we always go, he has a J2O and a Twix afterwards. He loves going to the golf house, the J2O and a Twix. I think that's probably the reason he goes. Um, anyway, he says to me, I said to him, why don't we play for the Twix? Let's put the challenge on. Talk about, talk about overload. So he got, he, he, the first hole, he got, a, he got like a seven or an eight, and I had a par, and I was like pretty, you know, ooh, yeah, lovely, lovely. He starts to go into meltdown. Start, the tears start to come. I'm never going to win the Twix now. So I start talking to him, and I said to him, Evan, Evan, you know, you, know, we can, you can come back from this. You know, the next hole's there. You can come back. No, you're going to win. And, and, and. I said, well, so now, I'm, now I've got a real dilemma now. So what do I do? I'm saying, OK, do I help him? You know, um, or do I guide him, or do I just let him suffer? Because there's an opportunity for him to develop from challenge here. <laughs> so anyway, we play the next hole, and it's worse, and he's got it. He's hitting out of bounds, and he's going absolutely. And he's like that. I'm saying, now, what's going to help you now? Is it is crying and getting into the? Is that going to help you, or is it going to? Is it going to? You know, is it going to make it worse? But anyway, we play the final hole, and I actually uh, I said to him, well, look, if you win the final hole, then we'll share the Twix. So we did, and we shared the Twix, and it was uh, I just completely caved in, didn't I? <laughs> there was an opportunity for some trauma, and I completely caved in, so I'm a massive fraud. Don't listen to anything I say. Um, the only thing I would say to you, though, is, is that it's a good example. It was a really good learning moment of, mm, got to think about how you layer this stuff in. That Twix was very important. I didn't realize it was going to be quite as important as it was. <laughs> so there's a story there for everybody. Um, thank you very much for listening.